uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azmi, for this uh, very uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, you are addressing um, uh, very important issues about the integration between the existing process safety management system and uh, digitalization. Uh, also, we hope that uh, maybe we have some guideline or some code of knowledge about the um, uh, uh, the new uh, how to integrate between the process safety management system and uh, fourth revolution. Uh, also, uh, we hope that um, uh, uh, many uh, or um, a lot of um, research or uh, uh, booklets or guidelines about to how to integrate big data and the industrial internet with uh, cyber security with the process safety management system. And we hope maybe in the in the near the future we can. Uh, have some HAZOB study, uh, automated HAZOB study, and we hope that we have a process hazard analysis automated without any manual, um, uh, uh, any manual or human, um, uh, a human uh, 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 work in that uh, field. Um, a lot of thank, uh, Mr. Azmi, uh, for this um, very important. Uh, very um, uh, uh, issues, and we uh, we know that uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, a center in the world and the process safety have how to integrate innovations with the process safety management system like um, uh, German Excellence uh, Safety Center have a lot a lot of study about how to integration between the um, uh, aspects of the process safety management system with uh, innovation system. Um, um, I appreciate your um, uh, participations and um, I am trust that your representation will be very useful to all uh, uh, participants. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, I think um, if there's some questions we have uh, or one minute or we don't have any time so that we switch to a new uh, speakers. And um, uh, we know that you have a very big uh, or very uh, uh, very big schedule. So that um, uh, a lot of thank for you, Mr. Uh, Azmi. Um, the next uh, the next speaker will thank be. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Yakov. Yeah. Thank you very much. The next uh, the next speaker is Dr. Stephen Petter, uh, director of Energy Institute, Intelligent Business Analytics UK. Um, the, um, the title of this uh, conference paper will be about the Energy Institute Process Safety Management System Framework, Performance Monitoring, and Associated Audit, uh, what we called a high-level framework of the EI applications. Dr. Stephen, uh, by the way, he is the author for the second edition of the EI high-level framework. We have the pleasure to um, arrange, uh, maybe before uh, three months ago, um, workshop with EI, and Dr. Stephen was uh, one of the key um, speakers of that. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Stephen, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jakub. Can you hear me okay? Can you see the slides? Yeah, very clear. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I hope you and all your loved ones are safe in these very challenging times. And I'm very pleased to be presenting here today. Uh, yesterday and today, you've heard a lot, and we'll hear a lot about the challenges of process safety management. I will, however, can, uh, have an opportunity for you to raise to these challenges and effectively manage process safety. Dr. So Stephen, can you can you share your uh, presentation, please? I know, Jakub. Yeah, very clear. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just go to the start. Can you see now, Jakub? Uh, yes, but maybe not uh, the first uh, the first uh, slide. Okay, so we going on a sec. Bear with me, gentlemen. Can you see now the first slide? No. Ah, yes. Now the first slide, maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Please. Well, basically, gentlemen and ladies, uh, I will introduce the Energy into Process Safety Management Framework, mm -hmm. the digitization and visualization of associated performance monitoring and audit and applications. So basically, the context is there's a number of incidents in the energy industry in various parts of the world, at upstream installations, what refineries and petrol storage facilities. I've highlighted the increasing importance of effective process safety management. Mm -hmm. The escalating consequences of incidents, uh, calling individuals into account in public, 
uh, investor confidence undermined, increased scrutiny uh, by regulators and governments. And to give you a context from a financial perspective, this was presented by Mass Risk uh, latter part of last year. Of the top 100 incidents in loss prevention, the lowest, uh, so the hundred of the incidents resulted in 175 million loss. We've got a lot of historical feelings in this area, guys. We've got the Buntsfield in the UK, Texas City, Deepwater Horizon, and yep, very recently, the Balagan refinery, a tragedy again. Recently linked to the COVID, a startup in India, following a shutdown for the COVID pandemic, a startup resulted in a release of gas, resulting in 12 people killed, including children. So what the manager need to know? How likely am I to have an incident free day today and tomorrow? They need to address three questions. How will we do that? What can go wrong? What systems are in place to prevent things going wrong? And how we know we're doing this? I think means I do not know. So the CEO's challenge and all of you guys in this sector is don't hurt anyone, don't harm anyone, make or receive the fiscal target. So from my perspective, guys, the word map on the left-hand side, the word cloud, is the element of what is included in the energy Institute's high level process safety framework. And it does what it says. In the UK, the three questions from the boardroom that must be answered is do we understand what can go wrong? Do we understand what systems are in place to uh, prevent things going wrong? And do we know these systems are working effectively? Six tenets of process safety leadership in high hazard operations. They need to satisfy themselves that major hazards are recognized and the worst potential consequences are understood throughout the business. Plant and equipment are provided which is fit for purpose to reduce the risk from major hazards to tolerable levels. Systems and procedures are provided which ensure proper operation from plant and equipment and which maintain that integrity. Sufficient staff with appropriate experience and training are provided to implement the systems and procedures. And very important, emergency procedures that respond adequately to foreseeable incidents are both in place and practiced. Incident investigation, monitoring and auditing performance take place in order to learn from experience and promote continuous improvement. So this is where the framework come in. It was developed by the industry, for the industry. It will be run through again this afternoon uh, by Mr. Lee Alford. Uh, uh, the new revision will be published in quarter two, 2021. So I'll focus quickly, guys, on the four focus areas. There are 20 key elements and 200 expectations. And there are a set of published guidelines to show that you can implement the good practices and process safety performance indicators. The PSM Sanko model basically highlights the dynamic and fluid situation of process safety managing whatever sector you're in. There are four areas, process safety leadership, risk identification and assessment, risk management, review and improvement. So to contextualize this gentlemen, no review and improvement without risk management, no risk management without risk identification and risk assessment, no risk identification and assessment without process safety leadership. So this is the framework in its entirety with the four focus areas and the 20 elements and the around 200 expectations. So each element, there are 20 key aspects of the operation we need to manage appropriately in order to assure the integrity of the operation. Each of the 20 elements has a series of expectations that are set requirements for meeting the aims and objectives of each element. And the expectation of things we should be doing in order to assure the integrity of the operation. So we've developed with the EI and our colleagues uh, the EI's process safety performance measure. This is fully aligned to the framework elements and expectations, and it ensures senior executives and managers of supervision understand how likely they are to have an instant free day tomorrow, have an up-to-date, clear and consistent understanding of compliance and performance levels across their organization on an absolute basis and relative to their peers. It identifies areas of strength and weakness versus a recognized framework, have robust basis for developing compliance, performance and improvement plans, and to demonstrate that they are leading on occupational health and safety leadership. 
It helps business and organizations like your own with business challenges like aging assets, changing regimes and maintenance, etc. Margin pressure, mergers and acquisition activities, seller buy side due diligence. It is established where we've uh, replicated and digitized and visualized all of the performance measures for the 20 elements, the four focus areas and the 200 expectations on the EI's process safety management framework. It is a fully integrated system that can be menu driven so you can take all of it. You can take some of it, you can align it with your business uh, framework management systems and you can select and you can also aggregate values of where you're adding compliance for the four focus areas. It's very intuitive and user friendly. It gives you graphical representation. As I say, you can interrogate every level from the CEO boardroom down to operational staff on the site, and you can select each element, it gives you a pictogram and a visualization of where you are against compliance, against the expectations of the framework. And as I say, the image on the right shows you can select it, so you can select all of the elements and the expectations, or you can just select the ones you're interested in. A benefit to this implication, I've implemented this framework in several organizations from UK oil and gas to high, high hazard manufacturer. And one example, a case that I published with Mr. Alford was over an 18 month period for an oil terminal in the UK. There was a significant reduction in administrative tasks and resources for data capture, data entry and data analysis. We had a zero accident frequency rate, zero process safety incidents, improved compliance and efficiency. And again, very important in this one, we look at this ladies and gentlemen, is improved financial performance. Subsequently, we developed now as the new uh, framework revision is gonna be published, an auditing tool, which is essential in my view from process safety management. So auditing is a process where an organization can review and continue manage, evaluate the effectiveness of their process safety management system, is a positive and proactive means of checking the process safety performance of an organization and identify extent of compliance with statutory and management system requirements. The application that we've developed allows for a systematic and robust, a robust audit of the process safety management system by either internal, so that's your own teams or external auditors. This allows for a consistent approach to the audits and reporting to identify gaps and inform continuing improvements and also give you big data where you can learn lessons and enhance the corporate memory of the organization. And this will be a value to senior management, should be fully committed to the concept of auditing and effective implementation within the organization. This application allows senior management to see real-time visualization and tracking of compliance. So it's again, it's a fully digitized system. Every element is covered. So we've got the four focus areas, they still don't do each element, they still don't do each expectation. It gives you then graphical representation of where you are. It's a scored auditing, which delivers a formal report in PDF and also graphical representation. So you can present to your teams, your sites, your management, you can use it as a benchmarking tool against all of your facilities. So, We've seen a lot, we've talked a lot, and we will be talking a lot about how do we avoid process safety incidents within our operations. So from a practitioner's perspective, that's me, this is quite straightforward. I believe that we all should follow a systematic management approach by fully implementing this energy issue process safety management framework in its entirety. Implement the energy issue process safety monitoring application and implement the energy issues robust audit process to ensure compliance. You know it makes sense. There's maybe argument about the different frameworks. From my perspective, whatever framework you're following, they're systematic, they need to be robust, they need to be fully implemented, they need to be measured, because if you measure it, you manage it. And then finally, you need to keep your closed loop systems by carrying out robust internal and external audits of your process safety management framework. So that's a quick thank, uh, run through Yakub. Uh, I'm open to any questions or if you want to leave it to the panel, uh, entirely uh, up to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. 
Dr. Steven, I have questions. We we think the second editions of the AI high level framework, and we have maybe uh, we have ideas to translate the AI to Arabic language because it's um, it's very effective. We we think that's very effective. Uh, I have uh, questions, uh, Dr. Steven. Yeah. Um, you are because you are the author of the second edition of the AI. We know that the CCBS normally will have some example mm -hmm. and case okay. study for we. Uh, uh, we normally have case study and uh, some examples. Um, uh, and uh, we know that you have um, a much survey for the implementation of the system. Uh, the implementations results and it can be published to uh, help the company to make the decision to use uh, your EI uh, high level framework. Uh, please in uh, two minutes maximum. Uh, can you unmute? Yeah, okay. okay, thank you, Yakub. On mute now. Thank you very much. Yes, Yakub, yeah, there is there is case studies published, and the new framework revision is due to be published in quarter two. And basically, there are examples and tools that can be used in there where this has been implemented. So that is available. I believe that uh, uh, JEA is talking to the Energy Institute and they've signed a memorandum of understanding where translation is uh, going to be covered off. And I believe that we'll be reaching out to you guys to see how you inform that process. So to make sure that it's fully aligned. So that's all in hand, Jakub. Lee will be on later on today, and I'm sure he'll reinforce that. So there are publications I can share with you. An article I wrote with myself and with Lee of the one example of the our case study. Uh, we can share with you the appendix of the uh, revision. I'm sure Lee will be able to do that, which give you some framework to help companies can either fully implement it or they can align it with their existing system because the applications and the digitization tools I presented here are also fully alignable to CCPS and also OSHA. So you haven't got to reinvent the wheel. There will be some modifications required, but it's basically about getting this kind of a framework and a systematic approach to prevent the horrific catastrophic failures that we we have encountered, and again, exemplified by several recent ones, that we need to be moving on. Do you know what I mean? So hopefully that answers your question. Any questions you want to send on the line to either myself or Lee, because I'll ca catch up with Lee later on. Is that okay, sir? Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Steven. We appreciate your knowledge and your deep knowledge in the process safety management system. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Mr. Abdelatif al Betawi, a professional business freelance uh, consultant and a trainer uh, based in Dubai, uh, United Arab Emirates. The title of the, uh, of the conference paper will be International Institute Risk and Safety Management, uh, Risk Management and Leadership Competence Framework. Uh, Mr. Abdel Latif, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yakub. Can, can you see my presentation? Uh, and still, still loading. Okay. Okay. Please maximize your presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdel Latif. Right. Ah, please maximize. Mm -hmm. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and greetings, everyone. It is a pleasure the, to take part in, in this conference. And um, I'm, I'm proud to be a member of Jordan Engineers Association, member of the Energy Institute, and a fellow specialist in the International Institute of Risk and Safety Management, which I'll be talking about their uh, management and leadership competence framework today. Just to give you a bit of uh, background about uh, WRSM, uh, it's a non-for-profit professional body established around 46 years ago, based in the UK, it has international reach. Uh, we have uh, local branches in, in UAE, in Qatar, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and some other places in the world. Um, it is a community for individuals uh, who has a common desire to 
uh, better manage risks and better make decisions in business. Um, membership is open to individuals who want to stand out uh, in their workplace for their risk competence, technical ability, and leadership. So the, the uh, WRSM developed a, a very useful tool that can be used by professionals in the area of risk management. And, and we, we're going to talk about this tool in, in, in a minute. Um, so we all, we all agree that uh, it is important to manage risk, to protect people, assets, environment, also maintain a good reputation of our organizations and, of course, profits. The question is always who's responsible for that? The simple answer is everyone's responsible for managing risks, each one in his or her position um, in the organization. However, to be able to successfully manage risk, you need a culture in your organization uh, where risks are openly discussed, challenged, and escalated. Now, being competent in risk management, of course, have so many benefits. And these benefits equally apply to those working in any or all risk disciplines and in all this, uh, decision makers across any organization. For effective risk management, we need three things. We need specialized risk expertise. So depending on which area you work and, and what, what's the, the activities, what are the context of the organization. So we need specialized expertise in different areas process safety, occupational health and safety, ergonomics, etc. We also need timely and empowered decentralized management decision making. You should have a very, very powerful way of making decisions um, uh, in a timely manner uh, to be able to effectively manage the risks encountered. We also need a central risk management system, which coordinates and underpins organizational policies, processes, cultures, and leadership at all levels. And this is um, um, becomes very critical and important for larger organizations who has um, uh, maybe number of operations, uh, number of activities, a number of sites that they manage. So having a central system, a management system, uh, is, is key and very important in order to effectively manage risks. So about this framework, this is really a very flexible tool developed uh, by uh, e, uh, WRSM with a consultation uh, and, con and collaboration with the industry experts. And the competencies which we will look at in a minute are presented in a very generic way, uh, which make it applicable within the context of your own area uh, of risk management. So the uh, so there are three levels that are set in this framework, um, and, and these levels uh, are the operational, managerial, and strategic. When we say operational, we expect that the, the, the person or the professional understands and has knowledge with some application. You go to a next, a higher level, which is the managerial level. Uh, at this level, we expect to have a clear application of this knowledge. And of course, the top level, which is the strategic one, then you have a reasoned advice and depth complexity. We will see in a minute how, how this applies. Uh, but before that, uh, let's understand you know, the, the principles that were the, the framework was designed based upon. So firstly, uh, we all, again, we all agree that risk management is core uh, business discipline and it should be embedded into all job roles. So it's really everyone in the organization whether he's an operator, a maintenance technician, a supervisor, an engineer, an accountant, any, any position, yeah, the, the risk management should be embedded in, in these job roles. The second principle is that everyone is a manager of risk and opportunity. Thirdly, everyone needs good leadership skills. Now, the, the, the skills may differ from one person to another, depending on, on the responsibilities and the role, but still, Everyone needs some good leadership skills. Risk management is an enabler and it supports innovation, increased performance and builds individual and organization resilience. We've been listening to uh, uh, our speakers yesterday and today about, again, new ways of doing things, managing process safety, 
Uh, we just listened to uh, uh, Professor Azmi about, again, the, the industrial revolution and how we can apply that to process safety. So again, risk management should enable those kind of innovations in, in order to uh, better perform. Also, of these principles, the competencies are purposely presented in a generic way, so it can be applied to different areas of responsibilities and locations. So this framework is not only applicable to the United Kingdom or Europe or you know Middle East or Asia or Africa. It applies everywhere, and it's not only applicable to uh, uh, industries such as oil and gas, man chemical manufacturing, food, but it applies to everything, even if it's a hospital, a school, a small company. Um, no one person or function can manage all the risks. In any organization, there are many, many risks, depends again on the size and the type of activity, but no one person in this organization can manage everything. Competencies and leadership behaviors are accumulated as individual progress. So who can use the, this framework or who, who can benefit from this framework? Really, we have so many users, um, types of users that can use the, the uh, framework. So this could be the risk and safety professionals, like you know, uh, process safety professionals. It also can be the employers and HR professionals. Regulators, we, we, also, we, we keep hearing from our, our respective speakers about the importance of having regulations uh, uh, when it comes to process safety management. Uh, universities, uh, those institutes who prepare the future generation. Uh, uh, recruitment agencies, and of course, the International Institute for Risk and Safety Management itself. Um, I, I, I won't go in details to each one of them, although it's really important to, to, to know, but I'll just take one example to elaborate more. So if we say the risk and safety professionals uh, for example, the process safety professionals, they want to use this framework. So this framework will help them do an assessment, a self-assessment. So where me as a professional, where do I stand? You know, what are my expertise so far? What are my qualifications so far? Uh, how do I compare, you know, with with my uh, peers um, in the same field? It also helps in career planning. So if, if I start at, at a certain, uh, working at a certain company in a certain position, how do I plan for my career? Uh, how do I want to progress in my career? I can use this tool to help me. Uh, of course, it's a useful tool for continual professional development, CPD, which is key to uh, really every, every profession, um, but more to people working in, in risk and safety management. And if you are a member in WRSN, then also it helps you in attaining your professional membership. So the framework has a number of technical competencies, which are seven. And, and these technical competencies um, um, are, are very good in the framework itself. I'm not each one of the details, but it's, it's nice to know that this includes the organizational tech context, role of risk management, strategy objectives, policy and procedures, project change management, stakeholder engagement, data management, risk and organization reporting. Okay, to clarify more. So if I'm a professional using this framework and I have to go to each of these technical competencies, what do I do? So I took an example, data management. If I'm at the operational level, then most probably I'm only collecting these data. This could be process data, safety data, whatever the data is, and just doing very preliminary analysis. If I go to a higher level, which is the managerial level, then most probably I, I'm analyzing the data collected and identifying trends and anomalies. And I do give insights to uh, uh, decisions about the strategy. If I go to the top level, which is the strategic level, then I'm analyzing these trends and anomalies to find solutions and deliver or challenge this strategy. So the point is that I look at, at each one of these technical competencies and I start assessing myself and finding where do I fit in these, in these you know, one of these three uh, levels. The same applies to the leadership behaviors. So we have again, eight leadership behaviors, emotional intelligence, influencing, collaborative, communicative, innovative, ethical, determined, and systematic. In a similar way, if we take innovative as an example, so at the operational level, 
um, the, the professional contributes uh, to discussion on new ways of work and open to learn from others. However, at managerial level, you expect to encourage others by challenging them and seek to learn and motivate others also to learn. Uh, and the strategic level, uh, so the, 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 the people at the strategic uh, level, they create environments where ideas overcome challenges and they seek opportunities to improve as an individual and as an organization in a whole. In, in summary, the framework can help people and organizations judge the level of risk competence required to build personal or organizational capability, uh, giving them a benchmark against which to recruit, retain, and develop staff. It's a good risk management competence and can provide both the individual and organization with a real competitive edge. Now, the framework will be available to everyone, and it's also available on the website. So I invite everyone really to look and read through the, the framework. It's, it's not very complicated. It's easy, but it's really very useful tool. And, um, um, and I'm sure you, you'll benefit of this, and it's available to anyone, even if you're not uh, a member in WRSM. Um, thank you for listening, and I'll give like a minute or two for questions if there are any. Uh, Mr. Abdel Latif, thank you for very um, interesting uh, framework. Um, I have questions. Um, do you have uh, some structure diagram for your framework, like CCBS uh, House of the Process Safety, like House of the Quality, so that um, the people will be uh, easy to understand your framework in just one figure or one diagram? Um. No, there, there isn't like, uh, if you say, um, a diagram or, or a process flow chart for that. Uh, but but if, you, if you read the, the framework itself, the document, uh, it's, it's easy and, uh, and self-explanatory. Uh, there are tables, of course, there that makes it easier also to follow, follow on this. But no, there isn't a process uh, flow uh, chart for this. Uh, because um, it's much easier uh, and, um, um, yeah, okay. I understand. Yeah, yeah uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Abdel Latif, for very informative um, um, uh, model, excellence model for the IR RSM. The next um, speaker will be uh, Mr. Mahmoud Sayem, uh, consultant, CEO of the uh, Schwerd Risk Pakistan. The title will be. Uh, why uh, the title for the conference paper, Why Hazob and Luba Fail. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sayem, the floor with you. Thank you, Jakub. Can you hear me? Yeah, very clear. Please right. share your presentation. Can you see my screen? Yeah. If you can maximize, thank you very All much. All right, uh, thank you very much, Jakub, for inviting me to this uh, seminar and listening to yesterday's uh, speakers. It's a wonderful and very well organized uh, seminar. Indeed, uh, uh, like me, everyone will agree that uh, we learned a lot yesterday and uh, the learning session today. Uh, very, very good effort. And thank you to all the speakers and all the listeners as well. Uh, just two days before uh, this uh, workshop, we we have seen a major fire in Indonesia. Uh, why I chose this topic, uh, why has all uh, failed or why Lopez failed, is because uh, uh, we, we keep seeing these incidents. We do has ops and Lopez for a reason to prevent these major accidents. So I, I, I went to, um, a number of failures uh, uh, through books and through literature and through uh, investigation reports. And you will, you will, I'll show you one slide uh, before I enter into my presentation formally that we are uh, almost failing in Hazard and Lopa almost every time. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a big statement to say almost every time, but yes, I'll show you there's a formal study about this. So I, I'll, I'll just touch very fundamental stuff, nothing uh, very uh, technical here, very basics. And I, I expect people to, to uh, focus on these basics because failing to meet or comply with these basics is the cause that has often no failed. A brief about me, I'm a technical safety consultant. Uh, I, I've 
uh, 20 plus years experience in processing cross safety engineering, worked with the uh, Engro, PDO, uh, and uh, BP as process safety engineer. And last six years, I'm working independently as a process safety consultant, and I've been doing a number of uh, process safety services for various organizations across the globe. And at this presentation, is based on my learning of these studies, these workshops with all of these organizations. It's not that this, this is something very theoretical. I, I have tried to, to uh, gather my, uh, my personal experiences uh, based on uh, my, uh, my, my interactions with various organizations, various workshops. Why I chose this uh, subject is, is because uh, you see uh, uh, these accidents happen. And Someone, uh, especially this guy, Paul Weybert, he, he looked into this ESP incident investigation reports. He developed a statistical analysis of all the investigations done by CSP in the last uh, around uh, 15 or 16 years. And he identified common causes in all of those accidents. And look at this. In all of the accidents, PHA failed. And he found out that the CSP investigations revealed that either the accident scenario was totally missed out in HESOP or PHA or whatever tool or technique was used for PHA, or there were shortcomings that led to failure. 100%, that's, that's, a, that's a very worrying number for, for any process engineer and should be worrying for every manager and leader. Number two common cause is inadequate safeguards, 56%. Despite compliance to standards, despite claims of uh, adhering to rugger gaps, we have, uh, we have gone through uh, some presentations on compliance with standards, rugger gaps, compliance with company engineering practices, we still see 56%. And that's even after when these IC 61511, 61508, this is becoming very common practice. That's a sales study. Yesterday, Dr. Abdul Aziz of Aramco gave a very good presentation on LOPA. And we see, and he identified the issues with, uh, with LOPA. And, and, and I, I think he almost covered whatever I'm going to talk. And it's a repeat of his presentation, almost a repeat of his presentation. And we, we see here that failure in BHA, 100% inadequate safeguard in 56%, which means that in, 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 in organizations, all of those organizations will be falling somewhere between these numbers. Even if there's no accident happening, it's just a matter of time. We, we have seen two days ago, major refinery failure. Professor Kletz wondered many years ago what went wrong, and then he came back and said, it's still going wrong. In his, uh, in his first book, What Went Wrong, he writes down, and this is the summary of process safety uh, uh, engineering. That is, most of the incidents are very simple. No esoteric knowledge or detailed study was required to prevent. Only a knowledge of what happened before. Very important. In HAZOS, we, uh, we are not doing some, some rocket science or engineering or any calculations. We are just applying knowledge of what happened before. And it's our failure to apply that knowledge in HAZOS that leads to the failure of that HAZOS or that PHA or that book. Why we do so, why we fail to learn is because all knowledge we have, we do not want to use. It's, it's, it, it mostly goes to waste. Accidents are not due to lack of knowledge, but failure to use the knowledge. It's not that we do not have, we have seen, we, every, every day we meet a very competent people. In this seminar, we have seen excellent presentations, presentations that are of very, very high quality, depicting that there is a very, very high level of process safety knowledge available with people. But then why? I refinery burnt out just two days ago. Why it is still going wrong? 
because human nature does not like to admit or reveal knowledge of problems. We are shy to admit that we have problems in our organization, we have problems in our operations and in our practice. We believe accidents cannot happen in our organization, in our plant, in our refinery, in our sugar industry, in our power plant. We believe we are perfect. Now let's, let's look at some of the common causes which I have encountered in past 15 years of HESOPIC. Number one, lack of leadership support. Yes, I have found out that most of the leaders are not convinced that PHAs or HESOPs are of any benefit to the organization. They do it under various obligations or pressures, complies with uh, codes and standards, complies with regulations or what. We are not convinced that this exercise is going to add real value to their productivity, to their safety, to their reputation or the market. That is the reason they do not dedicate the best resources or all the resources needed in terms of time and money. They just want it to be done as a checklist item. And that is why the managers are not convinced, and the leaders are not convinced, the managers are not interested. They believe either has all is a HSC responsibility or their achievement or their target, or it's just that it is a checklist item. And hence, they have to do it just because someone is asking to do it. In some way, they plan a bad HESOP and then convince themselves in the end, look, HESOP didn't do any benefit. Yes, it will not do any benefit if you do not want to get any benefit. One of the uh, uh, subsequent reasons arriving out of leadership commitment is overspeeding because you're not given adequate time. Yesterday, Dr. Abdul Aziz mentioned it, that uh, people want HESOPs and LOPA to be finished in two days, three days, very fast, do it, because we have to do other important tasks in our organization, overspeeding, project time pressure. And the HESOP leader fails to keep being focused. They indulge in design reviews, I'll, I'll come to that. They indulge in time wastage. Do, uh, the discussions and hence actual has often or PA chain is very limited. Timelines are often cast in stone. Project managers, especially, they they say this has all or this slope has to be done in this week or these many days, and that's it. You have to finish it. Finish or not, these are the days. There are budgetary constraints, there are time constraints. If you do not give adequate time, you're, you shouldn't expect the team to do a quality uh, discussion on his own. Then another evil, people are not dedicated for a PHO. The team member come in the room, tasked with other important deadlines, but they do multitask. Many times it's irritating for the facilitator, it's irritating for other participants. They, they just keep uh, indulge in emailing, preparing other stuff, sending uh, representations for, for next day for other stuff. They are just physically present in the room, they're not participating. A soft is a brainstorming session. It's not that we need you physically, it's not that we will ask you questions and then you are required to answer. You are here to participate in a discussion, in a debate, share your experience. It's not that we are uh, inviting you because we may have some question for you. Some people al always ask me, call me when you have a question for me. Call me when you need me. If I have to do that, then I can do a heads off on my desk, send you worksheets for your comment. No, that's not it. The brainstorming means brainstorming. Everyone must participate and experience their, uh, share their experience. Another uh, issue with all the HESOPs is that, that HESOPs 
convert into the design reviews. People start reviewing, uh, will the design work, will this work? Uh, sh should there be a better opportunity uh, or, or there, there's an alternate design? No, that's not. We are here to uh, judge whether we can successfully and safely operate the design. We are not here to design the uh, review, yeah. whether this valve is good enough size, whether there is a need of bypass or not. No, we are not here to do that. We are here to discuss what if the bypass is left open. Do not bring an immature or unreviewed design into the hazard. Another uh, 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 issue with the HESOPs is that the ground rules of HESOP are not discussed prior to entering the HESOP room. People start debating the rules in, during the workshop. For example, is a check valve a, a, a safeguard against reverse flow or not? Why are you discussing this in HESOP? Why didn't you issue a term of reference? With rules of the game, why you didn't agree with the terms of it's like playing a football match without setting the rules? Uh, Mr. Saim, uh, the remaining, please, the remaining two minutes. All right, all right, okay. And then the the common uh, issue with all the hazards is incomplete ESI package or inadequate information available in the room. Like yesterday, Dr. Abdulaziz saying, if you, you, you bring an, uh, wrong information or less information, you, are, you, you will end up either in over design or an under, under design. You will need to have all the required information, all the desired information as per the TOR in the HESOP. If you say, okay, we will search during the HESOP, that will waste time. If you say we'll uh, give it later on, that is not you have to bring all the information in the room right at that moment. Another uh, uh, issue with the HESOPs is linked to the risk ranking. The risk ranking we do in the HESOPs and LOPA is directly linked to the layers of protection as uh, we, we have uh, gone through in the LOPA presentation yesterday. There are various layers of protection involved in any design. And we assign certain risk reduction uh, credits each of these layers of protection. Sometimes we, we assign over credit and sometimes under credit. We have to agree on which layer of protection gives how much risk reduction. For example, we often give a high credit to a locked open valve marked on the light. Okay, that's a very good safeguard, but only if there is a robust management system in place at the ground to manage locked open or locked closed valves. In one of the HESOFs, I was doing the, the operations and the process. They insisted we, we have locked open valves, so we, we are not like, going to take it as a scenario for blocked out. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sime, a little yeah. thank for your um, uh, for informative and uh, lesson learned for implementation of the HAZOB. I agree with you that all knowledge where we have, if not used, it will be waste. A lot of thank, Mr. Sayem. The you next very much. speaker will be Mr. Noor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Noor Qudus, Research Associate, uh, Texas A&M University, USA. The title for the uh, conference paper will be Managing Storage Facility for Hazardous uh, Substance. Uh, Dr. Noor, um, uh, the floor is yours, and you can share what uh, uh, your presentation. Uh, please uh, unmute yours. Okay, thank you. Can you see it? Yeah. And your voice is clear. Let's uh, share your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is like an early in the morning here. Uh, so good morning, and uh, probably some part in the uh, world. This is in the afternoon. Uh, so my name is uh, uh, Noor Kudus. I'm a research engineer at the May, May K O'Connor Process Safety Center at Texas A&M University. Uh, the title of my talk today is Managing Storage Facilities for Hazardous Substances 
And uh, the title uh, or the, the topic came out from the uh, Beirut explosion uh, that happened last year. Uh, so these are the two incidents that are, I mean, we all are very familiar with. Uh, the first on the, on the left one, uh, we have a Beirut explosion site that happened last year, killed uh, uh, at least like 200 people, injured many others. And we have uh, like a, uh, a lot of uh, asset damage uh, and the human displacement, uh, a lot of misery that we all know. Uh, but there, is, there are a couple of incidents uh, regarding ammonium nitrate storage in, uh, involving ammonium nitrate storage. And one of them actually here, I mean, a few miles from uh, Texas A&M was West Fertilizer Explosion Site. So the, the, the incident killed 15 people, including 12 emergency responders. And we don't have any uh, incident investigation report available to us at this moment from Beirut explosion or other similar incidents like Tianjin, uh, but we can share some of the uh, uh, some of the lessons learned from West explosion. Uh, so the, the key lessons learned from uh, West explosion as uh, uh, investigated and published by Chemical Safety Board, CSB, uh, cover like 19 recommendation for uh, six federal, four state and one local, uh, local agencies. Uh, so, and if, if on the left side, you see that a lot of those recommendations are regarding training, outreach and guideline documents. Only one, or, uh, one uh, regarding uh, code and standards, and two are regulations. So we understand that how the emphasis on outreach program and training program like uh, to different agencies, through different agencies, to different uh, industry bodies. And on the right side, we see that the topic they highlighted that hazard identification because the hazards of ammonium nitrate storage was not uh, perceived uh, very well by many people and pre-incident planning, facility siting, and chemical inventory reporting that they have large bulk storage of ammonium nitrate and no one knows about it. And emergency response and fire protection, these two I will cover less in today's talk, that emergency response. And the finally, the risk communication that uh, tied back to training and outreach program that how risk communication is important because a lot of people or a lot of stakeholders are not aware of ammonium nitrate hazards, although it is very well known in scientific community. So there are a few specific recommendations for the storage facilities. And they include, uh, 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 these are the five points that I'll come back reiterate uh, many times in this presentation that prohibit combustible material uh, for the construction of this storage facility. Uh, so this is because if there is a fire and uh, these are combustible material, then they will aggravate the fire and uh, make the condition or deteriorate the condition. And the second is a define adequate ventilation, that ventilation is required, uh, absolutely required, but we have to define ventilation that whether we, we it's completely dependent on natural ventilation or uh, the force ventilation or air conditioning system or what type of ventilation system engineered or non-engineered uh, we have to adopt. And uh, the third one require automatic sprinklers and a smoke detection system and any other firefighting system. And a lot of agencies tie these requirements with uh, uh, the bulk quantity that you can store. And uh, the last two are up, uh, require isolation. That means ammonium nitrate cannot be stored along with a lot of other uh, substances because of con you know, the potential contamination or potential um, or uh, source, as a source of ignition. 
So we, we have those things uh, settled out. We know that what are the material like organic substances cannot be stored with ammonium nitrate at, uh, and so on. And established separation distances like a, uh, what might be uh, a reasonable distance uh, for the local community, other, uh, other, other communities housing like schools or hospitals, something like that, that we need to establish that separation distances. And uh, just after um, uh, West explosion in the United States, there are uh, several uh, executive orders and that followed by uh, some changes regulations. And as part of that, OSHA issued uh, process safety management for storage facilities in 20, uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, OSHA says that like a, OSHA has process safety management, uh, the program which has, for, for has 14 elements, but OSHA emphasized uh, seven of those elements, uh, particularly employee participation, process safety information, process hazard analysis, uh, mechanical integrity, training, operating procedure, emergency planning and response. Uh, there are hardly anyone who will doubt that these seven components are actually essential for a storage facility. Although like being a storage facility, non, not as an operational unit, uh, we sometimes, I mean, OSHA PSM exclude a storage facility from uh, PSM implementation. Uh, but uh, uh, my take on this is management of change is another uh, element uh, that should be seriously considered by OSHA PSM for the storage facilities. So you can tie these all these elements uh, to the uh, initial findings of the CSB that hazard identification, uh, the ventilation requirement, and uh, the status of those uh, systems uh, in the mechanical integrity, uh, the PSI you can relate to what are the substances that are incompatible with uh, ammonium nitrate storage and so on. And the people who are uh, dealing with these substances or dealing with the storage facilities, they need to understand all, all above. So the, the training and operating procedures are absolutely relevant. So OSHA has Uh, OSHA has some specific guidance uh, for ammonium nitrate storage requirements as, uh, and they, uh, they suggested like in, to follow some of the NFPA guidelines. Uh, so uh, here, like we see that they require for adequate ventilation, the non-combustible material for the building material. And this is one additional one that they say that the storage has to be maintained uh, below 130 degree Fahrenheit, that is a, a, around 53 degree, uh, 53 or 54 degree far, uh, Celsius, that above that you have, have to uh, take a certain engineer control. And avoid contamination. This, is, this comes like in many documents that uh, ammonium nitrate decomposes uh, when they're stored with uh, different substances and or if there are contamination and with the prills. Uh, so there are different mechanisms proposed in the literature for the ammonium nitrate, and we will not go into that detail, uh, but we understand that uh, contamination is a, is a very important parameter for ammonium nitrate. And not more than uh, 2,500 uh, uh, tons uh, of bagged ammonium nitrate shall be stored in a building structure not equipped with automatic sprinkler system. So here we have some guidelines for the fire protection system. We'll, we'll see that in detail uh, in a in couple of slides. And here also like it's some portable and uh, portable fire extinguishing requirement. So uh, apart from OSHA document, there are uh, the chemical advisory, uh, safe storage handling and management of ammonium nitrate jointly issued by EPA, or OSHA and ATF. ATF is, a, uh, is, is for alcohol, tobacco, firearms and explosion authority in the United States 
EPA stands for Environmental Protection Agency, and OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So these are three organizations. Uh, there are some uh, requirements from the FDA on fertilizer storage, uh, but this, this document initially was issued by three, uh, these three agencies in August 2013. They have a couple of different requirements. The first one is the, uh, the building design. Uh, it, it's required that one story building and uh, no basement unless the basement is open on the one side. And they have some specific requirements on uh, the, how the confinement should be, what are the temperature, the ventilation, and the uh, building material and so on. So we see that the, there's a trend of the guidelines and the build uh, for, for the ammonium nitrate storage. And if we see like a uh, more detail that, uh, that a specific chemical at the same, same document, but storage in the bulk, uh, so I have two images on the top one is actually from uh, the storage facility as a uh, port of Beirut before the explosion. And the bottom one I, uh, I collected from- uh, uh, Dr. Noor, uh, yes. please you have the remaining time, two minutes. Uh, so uh, here like a, the storage facilities, we, we see that on the, on the Beirut one that how they are incompatible uh, with the guide, these guidelines. And so I, I'll, I'll uh, go a little quicker uh, since I have only two minutes here. The, again, another, uh, the two pictures at the Beirut explosions, like how they didn't follow the guidelines and they didn't maintain the distances uh, that actually required for these uh, storage bags. Uh, so uh, this is some fire protection requirements uh, that actually I mentioned. I'll skip to this one. This is some UK HEC guidelines, but this is the, like the last part that actually I want to focus that large score storage facilities, although like we are doing all of it, but we have to do some detailed risk assessment, uh, such as like this is the waste fertilizer explosion uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, consequence analysis, we see that uh, at the red one, that was the school, and at the middle of the circles, that is the waste fertilizers, uh, the plant where the explosion occur. And the different circles indicate that different safe distances by different authorities. So we need to figure out that what might be the appropriate uh, the safe distances. And when we do the risk assessment, especially for the large facilities, uh, no matter what the regulation says, we have to be careful with the risk assessment for the safeguard. And we see here the same, uh, see here the distances like a, about 190 and 865 meter. And look at the distances here for the Beirut explosion and the, the, our recently published paper. And on the right side, uh, we have uh, uh, the overpressure created by the explosion and see like the overpressure was pretty high even after the one kilometer range. Uh, so this suggested that uh, regulatory oversight is absolutely required. There are some good guidelines, but in-depth risk assessment is required for large scale facilities. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that we need to convey this message to all stakeholders, not only the, uh, the engineers or the facility owner, but the government communities uh, at every level that they need to understand. Otherwise we will keep seeing these ammonium nitrate incidents in the different part of the world and which actually saddens us very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, uh, Dr. Quddus uh, for highlighting the, uh, the international guideline uh, which addressing the process safety related to the storage facility. Dr. Matouk. Thank you very much, my colleague. Uh, and now we are going to call on our next speaker, uh, Mr. Amin El Wardat. He is the labor inspector and occupational safety and health specialist from Lebanon. He is going to talk about the role of the International Labor Organization in enhancing occupational health, uh, safety and health in the Arab region. Uh, 
Mr. Amin, the floor is for you. Please go ahead. You have 15 minutes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my presentation, as you mentioned, will be on the role of the ILO in uh, enhancing uh, occupation safety and health and labor inspection in the uh, Arab region. But, but sorry, I have to stop uh, the video because um, I have some problems. If it continues, I will lose connection. Yeah. Uh, so I will share the screen. Mm -hmm. Can you maximize it? Yes. Thank you. So I'm uh, going to start uh, with a brief about uh, the ILO. Uh, the International Labour Organization is a specialized UN agency uh, mandated to deal with all uh, labor issues. Uh, it was established in uh, 1919 before the, U uh, the United Nations itself was established and it joined the uh, United Nations in 1946. It has a unique structure by being a tripartite uh, one, uh, as uh, its governing body has uh, representatives from governments, employers, and workers, with equivalent numbers of workers and employers to those of the uh, government uh, representatives. The ILO has uh, 189 member states and has around uh, 3,000 staff at the global level in uh, its offices and uh, projects. Uh, the current agenda of the ILO is uh, decent work for all. By decent work, we mean uh, productive opportunities for women and men uh, to obtain uh, decent productive work in conditions of freedom, uh, equity, security, and uh, human dignity. Uh, to achieve uh, decent work for all, the ILO has uh, developed four strategic uh, objectives. Uh, these are the uh, promoting the fundamental principles and rights at work, uh, uh, ensuring decent work employment opportunities for all, uh, social protection for all, and strengthening tripartism and social dialogue. Uh, by fundamental uh, uh, principles and rights at work, uh, we mean four main uh, elements, uh, which are the uh, freedom of uh, association and effective uh, recognition of collective bargaining, uh, elimination of all forms of forced and or compulsory labor, uh, effective abolition of child labor, and elimination of uh, discrimination in respect to uh, employment and uh, occupation. Uh, to achieve its objectives, the ILO developed a set of uh, conventions uh, and instruments, which include the conventions, the recommendations, codes of practices, and guidelines and handbooks. And the conventions are uh, open for their ratification by uh, member states and their implementation uh, become binding to the countries which ratify those uh, conventions. Uh, we, as mentioned earlier, we, ha uh, we have uh, 189 uh, member states and we have so far developed 190 conventions uh, covering different aspects of uh, labor, such as uh, uh, child labor, working hours, uh, wages, occupation, safety and health, uh, domestic work, uh, etc. And uh, uh, those conventions can be divided into uh, three groups. Those are uh, priority conventions uh, or priority or core conventions, uh, technical conventions and governance uh, conventions. The uh, priority conventions or the core conventions, they cover four areas, which are the uh, cover the fundamental principles and rights at work. Uh, conventions uh, 29 and 105 cover the forced labor, and 87 and 98 cover the freedom of association and the right to organize. Uh, conventions 100 and 111 cover the uh, discrimination uh, at, uh, uh, in respect of employment and work. And uh, 138 and 18 cover the child labor uh, with the 181 being on the elimination of the worst forms of child labor. Uh, the, the, the uh, out of the 180 conventions, 
uh, we have uh, about a third of them, more than 70 conventions on uh, occupation safety and health. And uh, uh, occupation safety and health is one of the main uh, priorities of the ILO for the uh, impact, uh, so for its impact on the lives and the quality of life of people. Uh, the ILO and the WHO, WHO estimated uh, the occupational injuries and uh, illnesses and their impact at the global level uh, as follows. Uh, they estimated that uh, more than uh, 200, sorry. Uh, they estimated that uh, more than uh, 2.78 million deaths at the global level take place every year due to work-related uh, reasons. Uh, out of those, uh, 2.4 are attributed to occupational diseases uh, and uh, three po and uh, and uh, the rem and uh, three point uh, three hundred and fifty thousand are attributed to uh, sorry three hundred and eighty thousand and five hundred deaths are attributed to uh, work related accidents and uh, diseases. Uh, uh, work related accidents and diseases also uh, result in 1,000 people losing their lives every year, and 6,000 and 500 of them uh, lose their lives because of occupational uh, diseases. These uh, accidents, uh, injuries, and diseases uh, result in the loss of uh, more than about 4% of the uh, gross domestic product at the global level. Uh, the ILO conventions on OSH, uh, on occupational safety and health, as uh, mentioned, which form about uh, 80, uh, about 30 uh, percent of uh, or more of all ILO conventions, uh, can be divided into three groups. The first one is for guiding uh, policies and actions uh, at the national level for improving uh, occupational safety and health and the prevention of accidents and uh, injuries. Uh, those are, uh, this, this group includes three main conventions, the Convention 155 on Occupational Safety and Health, Convention 161 uh, on Occupational Health uh, Services, and Convention 187 on the Promotional Framework for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, the second group is for the protection of uh, uh, specific branches of economic activities, such as the uh, uh, Convention 167 on Occupation and Safety and Health uh, in Construction. And the third group is for the protection of workers against uh, specific risks, such as the Convention 170 on uh, Chemicals. Regarding the ratification of those uh, of ILO conventions, the main ones on occupation safety and health, the uh, benzene convention number 136 was ratified so far by 38 countries at the global level, and only five countries uh, out of the 24 uh, Arab countries in the Middle East and uh, North Africa ratified this convention. Convention 155, Occupation Safety and Health Convention, was ratified by uh, 71 countries at the global level and only three countries at the, uh, in the Arab countries. Uh, Occupational Health Services, Services Convention 161 was not ratified so far by any Arab country, while it was ratified by 34 uh, countries at the global level. Uh, chemical Convention, uh, which is the uh, topic of the uh, uh, this conference was ratified only by uh, two countries, uh, two Arab countries, and uh, 22 countries at the uh, global level. Uh, the uh, promotional uh, framework for occupation safety and health uh, convention, which is one of the most important conventions on occupation safety and health, was uh, ratified by two Arab countries only, which are Iraq ratified it in 2015 and Morocco ratified it in 
the main features of the OSH conventions are they are generally applicable. Uh, they uh, apply to all sectors of work with uh, some flexibility. Uh, countries ratifying this conve those conventions can exclude some uh, uh, sectors or some groups of workers, uh, but they have to notify the ILO for the reasons behind such uh, exclusion. And those conventions target, target the governments, workers, and employers, and they include their uh, duties, responsibilities, and uh, obligations. And they are based on uh, partner tripartism, that's uh, full partnership between the government, uh, workers' organizations, and employers' uh, organizations. And uh, uh, in those uh, conventions, the uh, principle of uh, prevention is accorded the highest priority. Uh, the, uh, the, the, those conventions are uh, structured in a way to provide the clear definitions, uh, scope, and uh, exclusions of the provisions of those conventions. They include the general principles on the on occupation, safety, and health, and on the prevention of uh, injuries and diseases. Uh, they include the responsibilities of competent uh, authorities and workers and employers uh, representative. They also include the uh, responsibilities of the manufacturers and uh, exporting countries. And those conventions are uh, designed to prevent uh, work-related accidents, injury, uh, injuries, and diseases, including major industrial accidents, uh, such as the uh, Beirut blast, which uh, took place in August 2020. The Chemical Convention 170 uh, provides a blueprint, a blueprint for sound management of chemicals in the workplace as it covers the obligations, the responsibilities, and duties of uh, government, employers, and workers. Also, it refers to the classification uh, system for the chemicals, labeling uh, them and operational control measures to control them in addition to design and installation of work systems, uh, practices, uh, and personal protection against those chemicals. Mr. Amin, you have two minutes. Oh, that's too short time. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so the, the Chemical Convention 170 provides for sound management of chemicals uh, in the workplace in uh, three steps, uh, three steps, including identification of chemicals and classifying them, a determination of potential exposure and risk assessment, and identifying and applying the control uh, measures. Uh, one, uh, some of the key factors we consider in the ILO as uh, some of the factors we consider uh, key for the for sound management of chemicals is effective engagement of uh, workers and employers on all related activities, including uh, policies and uh, strategies. Uh, we in the ILO provide technical support to the member states to implement those conventions uh, through development of national OSH systems, which include uh, reforming the legislation and enhancing technical capacity of the uh, authorities in charge of uh, monitoring the uh, occupation safety and health at the national level. We also provide technical support for uh, reforming the legislation uh, itself in line with the international labor standards and uh, good, good practices at the national level uh, uh, through full uh, consultation and engagement of uh, social partners. Mr. Prahib, uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the, uh, okay, okay, lastly, I would like okay. to mention one of the main uh, uh, things that we work on in the, uh, at the global level. Uh, in general and in Arab countries in particular is promoting the strategic compliance planning approach, uh, which is a model uh, developed by the ILO for uh, uh, ensuring uh, uh, efficient use of the resources in labor inspection, uh, including uh, occupation safety and health uh, inspection. And this model uh, is uh, designed uh, with the three uh, six steps which includes exploring the labor inspectorate in terms of their technical and human resources, exploring the issues and targets and uh, violation, type of violations of the national legislation, and in exploring the influences and the underlying, underlying causes of non-compliance, 
uh, then exploring the stakeholders and partners for uh, who could contribute to achieving best results, then exploring interventions and action for uh, promoting compliance with the national legislation, then uh, the last step includes uh, developing and uh, uh, operationalizing the strategic compliance plan. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, but yeah. I want to say that this model now has been uh, being applied in Jordan, Palestine, and Iraq. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mahama Prakash. Thank you for very interesting and valuable information about the safety in the Arab region. Uh, now we have the three questions for our panelists. Uh, the question is, uh, first question to me, actually it's, uh, we will start with Dr. Abdel Latif. How we can say that everyone is a manager and this, at the same time, we are talking about central risk management. Dr. Abdel Latif, this is a question for you. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Welcome. Um, so first of all, there is a difference between being between saying everyone is responsible on managing risk and being a manager. So not everyone is a manager, but everyone is responsible for managing risks in their area or in their uh, uh, sections or departments. However, even if it's that everyone is responsible for managing risk, we still have to have a, a central management system. So, you know, not every employee will come up with his or her own management system. You have one central management system, okay, applied all through the organization, but then everyone in the organization has some responsibility. The, the old, if you say the old way of doing things is that there is, you know, a number of specialized health and safety personnel in each organization who are responsible for health and safety and then everyone else is not this is this this is changing and this has to be changed so this is the what i meant by everyone is responsible for managing risks but this is the system for maybe you have a problem with the voice uh, dr abdul latif Uh, can you repeat, please, Mr. Abdul Latif? I'm not hearing you. You are muted, uh, Dr. Abdul Latif. Okay, uh, the second question will be to uh, Dr. Sayem. Uh, actually, we have more than one, two, three questions. I will select one of them. Uh, if any refinery successfully operate for 10 to 20 years, and any incident after that, how one can conclude that hazard failure could be the reason? This is the question for Dr. Sayem. Is it for me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so so uh, like uh, if if you take example of uh, two days ago the Indonesian refinery, or let's uh, look at uh, the BB Texas City refinery. We look at uh, the uh, actual incident, and then we pick up the hazard or BHA or local, and we see whether this was discussed in any of the hazards or not. If the scenario was not touched or not discussed in, in the song, and it has happened, then surely there, there is fundamentally something wrong with the way we do our health of the agent. And that's what the CSP study found. Yes, please. Uh, could you repeat it again? Because I couldn't hear you. Okay. What I'm okay. saying, what I'm saying is that okay, you have 
to to look at the cause of the accident. Okay. Okay. So so look at the cause of the accident, then then take out all of your uh, PHA dissolves or whatever studies you have done, even your QRAs. Take out those studies and see whether those uh, studies include or have discussed the, the scenario that has happened. If the scenario has not been discussed, and as the study I have quoted, in 100% of the accidents, those scenarios were not discussed, which means the, the, there's fundamentally something wrong with the way his ops are carried out. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question for Mr. Amin. Uh, what is ILO, a plan for a trading labor? A plan, sorry. What is the ILO, a plan for training labor? Dr. Amin, Mr. Amin. I can't hear you well. Uh, ILO plan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is the I, uh, ILO plan for training labor? Uh, okay, for training uh, workers. Yes. Uh, as mentioned uh, during my presentation, we engage workers and employers representatives in all uh, of our activities. Uh, and uh, part of the support we provide is on capacity building. It includes comprehensive capacity building programs to uh, workers as well as to employers uh, representatives. And these uh, capacity building programs are implemented either uh, uh, directly face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, but now there are some restrictions with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we also uh, organize such programs through uh, our training center in uh, Turin in Italy. We have a big uh, international training center which provides all uh, types of uh, occupation safety and health courses. And uh, every year we uh, provide fellowships to workers to participate uh, on those uh, courses. Uh, since the COVID-19 uh, crisis started, we have been organizing uh, many uh, distance learning courses and uh, online uh, training programs. Uh, and if somebody is uh, interested from the workers and employer uh, representatives, they can uh, uh, write to me and I, can, I, I would see how can we uh, enroll them uh, in those courses. Thank you very much. The last question to, to uh, Mr. Siam. Uh, the question is apart the general aspect mentioned like leadership and over speed or mm -hmm. multitask which are common and impact even environmental studies. What are the technical cause of failing hazard and lupa? Thank you very much. Okay, so some of the, the technical causes were discussed yesterday by Dr. Abdulaziz in his presentation at the end of the day. I repeat uh, very quickly, one is unavailability of the ground data, the PSI package, to uh, ignoring the ground realities. For example, I give example of the lock open. In one has ops, uh, we, we consider lock open as a safeguard against inadvertent failure of a well. During the hazard break, I went out into the field and uh, I saw there were many wells marked locked open or locked closed on the PNID, but at the, in actual, they were not, there were no locks. So we have to see whether we are basing the hazard based on actual operational practices or not. Another uh, case is uh, taking credit of alarms. Uh, we do not even have any written procedure to respond to alarms, but operations complain. We will take it as a credit. We will take corrective action based on the alarm, uh, irrespective of um, whether there are adequate response time available or not. And one of the technical uh, um, a question that comes out when taking credit to alarm is the human response. And human factor specialists uh, know that, okay, it's one thing to have uh, the uh, response plan available, response procedure available, response time available, okay, fine. The other thing is, uh, what is the condition? If we go back to yesterday's presentation on uh, uh, it's really, uh, the confirmation bias, the, uh, uh, sometimes the operator believes that alarm is false in, uh, in terms of like uh, Gulf of Mexico incident. We were not considering the indications as uh, something is going wrong with the confirmation. But the other thing is the mode 
is it a, a normal uh, emergency, a normal operation alarm or is a, a alarm during an emergency shutdown? There's a hell lot of difference. The human error rate in a normal situation is say one in 10 or one in 100. But the same human, if he gets an alarm and needs to respond in an emergency situation, the human error rate is one in three. I had a lot of difference. So we need to look at number of technical things which, which uh, lead to, to uh, these uh, factors. And because this is all linked to the risk ranking we do in his ops approval. So if we take undue credits of things, our basis is not uh, as is on the ground, you may end up under designing, which we never realize. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, good answer. And uh, by this, there uh, will be the last question. And uh, let me, on behalf of our community organization, to thank uh, all our speakers in this session. And also thank to my colleague, Mr. Engineer Yaqub, to moderate the session before me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Azmi, Dr. Stephen, and uh, Mr. Dr. Abdel Latif, uh, Dr. Saim, and also Nur Khudos, Amin Reddat, all of you. Thank you uh, very much. And now we have uh, our colleague to, yeah, to distribute the questionnaire. Now he will distribute, and I, I think you can see now the screen. There are some questions. Uh, they can answer it and uh, run the polling. Uh, after finishing the polling, we will go for the next session. We will start uh, shortly after exactly two minutes, three minutes, and the session will start soon. And I will ask uh, Dr. Faisal Khan to be ready for the next session. And also my colleague Shaima, she is going to moderate this session. So at the meantime, you can uh, see the polling now, and we will see the result uh, soon. Uh, again, thank you very much for your participation, and uh, see you again. And we are happy that we have now a good participants at the same time, more than 700 participants now, if you can see this. It's okay. Mr. Chair, can I share the presentation or should I wait for an uh, announcement? Okay. Thank you. Good evening. I would like to welcome everyone in this uh, second session for this day and welcome uh, our first key person in this uh, second part, uh, Mr. Faisal Khan, Professor and Canada Research Chair Associate and the Dean of Graduate Studies. Uh, CRI's Memorial University, Canada. Our title of this lecture is uh, Listen from COVID-19 Safety and Risk Engineering Perspective. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Mr. Khan, you can uh, share our, your presentation. Mr. Khan, you can start. I hope you all could see the presentations. Yes. Okay, very good morning and uh, salam alaikum for those who are following the faith. Uh, thank you for uh, the invit invitee since uh, this is being a great pleasure for me to be part here and I'm happy to see some of my colleagues and friends uh, to being part of the today's uh, discussions. Um, the place where I'm in is a very, very early in the morning. So as you could see, the sun is uh, trying to come out. Um, what I'm hoping to talk today is uh, give you a perspective of what we all are passing through is COVID-19 and what lessons have we learned both in its occurrence and what engineering principles could we or should we be using it in order to manage it in a more effective or better way. And then towards the end, I will summarize some of the findings of our recent work. So first to let's quickly ask ourselves that where we are uh, since uh, 
So in a quick summary, we have been 400 days now to this particular pandemic, where in at least from where I come from, about 360 days of complete lockdown means I'm living in the periphery for about five kilometers, having trouble more than or beyond five. And the questions remain, well, we are passing through this challenging time, but what we have learned, the two quick message that has come out to us in the loud and clear, as we often see by our industrial accidents also, the prevention is better than cure and protection is the must. Now, the remaining part is where I'm hoping to focus, how the principle of safety and risk engineering benefit us to better manage the pandemic risk. And that is particularly from our process industries, from our supporting uh, services who have been greatly impacted, but being critical in nature need to continue operate, unlike many of us who could operate remotely. So how do and we should ensure that that takes place? So my first and foremost is what we have learned about occurrence of this pandemic is something that has come up a, out of a simply an act of God, or have we been given a sign of it and we failed to recognize? And towards this end, I will briefly play a video of Bill Gates of a talk which he gave in 2015. So please bear with me for a minute. When I was a kid, the disaster we worried about most was a nuclear war. That's why we had a barrel like this down in our basement filled with cans of food and water. When the nuclear attack came, we were supposed to go downstairs, hunker down, and eat out of that barrel. <laughs> Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. So my dear friends, this is 2015. So you're talking about five years before we hit the pandemic. So it is not something that we haven't, or the visionary folks haven't seen it. We had Ebola, we have in Canada SARS epidemic, we have H1N1, and we have Zakia going through as we are in, through pandemic COVID-19. So there were clear signs of that something major in form of infectious disease is coming. It's simply lack of preparedness from our end had made us to be where we are today. And that's the focus of of my talk today is that likewise in industrial operations, we often consider accidents as a simply an act of God. But if we really look into deeply, we see the sign of its initiation or occurrence early. And those of us who have prepared for such eventualities, able to cope and manage it better as compared to those who react to it. So my key questions or key comments remain to be today, should we learn to respond of a situation like this or should we react to it? And that's something which I'll leave with you to be ponder on for the next 15 to 20 minutes. In field of uh, safety and risk engineering, we often undertake detailed study of any unwanted situations and we prepare for it so that we can better respond. The activities we undertake as a part of risk assessment to identify what could go wrong, and then we try to qualify or quantify how likely it is and what it would cause if it occurs. And these outcomes we sub combine to quantify the risk and subsequently design the management plan to minimize this risk. And this minimization plan or management plan could either be the policies development so that we can able to develop guidelines to manage things better. And that is how our highly hazardous operations such as nuclear industries, chemical industries, or high other engineering projects often work 
forward. So in case of pandemic, we have the similar challenges. We have human sufferings because of the infectious disease and causes, but that also having issues with our economics, with our other part of our economic system. So when we try to flattening the human suffering, that has to be in combination of the financial and other resources. So through the process of risk assessment, we should be able to identify the policies and procedure that help us to prepare better to respond to such conditions. And in industry, we do that all the time for many of us who have been proactive and deal with hazards on a regular basis. So how do we do that? Using the principle of safety, as we talked about, there are eight different steps that we undertake as a part of responding to a evolving condition. And I will cite example of all the eight steps with relation to the pandemic as we are passing through. One of the key elements of these eight step process is identifying what we call early fault or a case detection. So in the process industries, which deals with hazards, we set up indicators that give us the idea that operations is going beyond normal. And we often call them or characterize them as an abnormal operation. These abnormal operations give us a indication that there's something somewhere wrong. We may not know where and when it's happening, but at least we have outcome that tell us the sign. And these early indications tell us or prepare us to be able to look deeply and find the source of that particular effect. When we apply to pandemic, we have seen that those countries who have acted early in identifying the calamity or the impact COVID could have, has prepared themselves. Taiwan comes out to be one of the great championing in that, who saw the early sign of it and sealed the border and protected the population with a very effective management strategies of how they cope up. And that's perhaps the reason why they have, though closest to China, but had one of the minimum caseload. Once we have identified the problem, that there is something major coming because we saw the abnormal operation, the next is to identify the vulnerable group or susceptibility. The abnormality which we are observing in our process system, where and how could it impact? That's the key aspect for us to be able to clearly understand and analyze where the system could fail. Because if you take a process system, a high pressure in the pipeline, while might be doable with a pipeline, but it might have a severe impact on the reactor. So we need to identify and protect the, our critical equipment as we are managing this abnormality. And likewise, in a pandemic, if we could have applied the principle and identify our vulnerable population, such as our seniors, such as our healthcare professionals, such as those who have immunodemine uh, uh, deficiencies, we would be able to prepare and protect them better so that their cost load would have been lower. And that has been an example of many countries who have, rather than isolating the whole population, has isolated the critical group far more restricted than the normal population. And that has helped them better. Once we have identified the vulnerable group, we try to develop the risk scenarios. And that risk scenarios identify or must be holistic in nature. Means they consider both fatality and associated risk. In the pandemic situations, many countries had tried opting for a lockdown as a quick, easy measure without realizing the greater impact it could have. And India is an example of it. While they had the first round of pandemic and they locked down, that created a very chaotic situation in the country, perhaps left millions of people on the street as moving through from point A to B. So the country need to consider holistically that how the scenarios they are dealing with, action they are proposing would lead to a evolving risk scenarios. And it is proven now that the impact that this exodus in India had a significant, significant impact to the overall COVID case cases. Had it been not locked down and better managed, perhaps it would have served a bit more effective way. Now, once we have identified the scenarios, 
it is time for developing the response. So we now know the problem. We know who are the most vulnerable populations. We know how the situation will evolve if we take an action. Now it is time to develop the policy procedures and actions. And that's what we do in our industrial operation. So in a pandemic study, we have series of actions right more extreme lockdown to the social distancing call. Each has its impact, each has its probability of failure because of the nature they are. And we consider both aspects as a layer of protection as many of our colleagues have already spoken about. Once we implement that, uh, our developer response, we implement these response in a hierarchical way. Means first initiating actions that try to eliminate the possibility of the spread and its impact. And that's the key aspect for our studies. That's something which we are very dear to our heart and we strongly recommend to follow. That first we try eliminating the hazards, then we develop the controls and then administrative control and then PPE. So if you take this example to pandemic, we try to remove the pathogens. That means isolating the populations, those who are highly vulnerable by ensuring that pathogen never comes to that particular location. And then we develop the controls, which means using the uh, basic barriers, physical barriers, so that we can able to maneuver between the people who likely to get infected to those who are not. And then administering the control, monitoring it. And the last is the personal protective gear, such as what we use these days as, as a face mask, and other activities or washing hands. So all these play important role, but they all have their protection. They all have a cheese model, a holes which can lead to fail. So they need to be implemented in a hierarchically structured manner so that we know where and how they're likely to fail so we can prepare accordingly. Once we implement the responses, we undertake that how the response likely to be once these are implemented. And that's a numerical study we often take, and both medical scientists in epidemiology undertake these detailed study to see the effect, how in the conditions when we design the intervention, this intervention will be likely to be causing an impact or making an impact. So here in the slide, as you see, we have a no response uh, expectations based on the known cases, but as we in develop interventions, we see how the scenario would look like. So this is the roadmap which we have simulated. So we know that if we do the lockdown, the next 30 days, this is the case load would look like. And this helps us so that we know what to expect. And we move to the next step to see if the expectation are meeting. The lockdown which we designed, has it been giving the results we are hoping to get? And if not, then there's something somewhere wrong. And that we need to revise it immediately without further delay. The same thing which we do in our processing facilities. When we take in a control action or a safety measure, we monitor its effectiveness to ensure that the action is serving its intended purposes. And if it is not, then perhaps we need to look into more detail and design accordingly or revise the response accordingly. And that's an important part because if we do not have this step, we will be continue living uh, ourselves in, in, in a dark room, thinking we took the right action, but for some reason, the response is not as expected. And this will make us to go in a darker situation. Once we have this active plan, where we have planned to change the plan, we are moving forward into a more, what we call a resilient system, which means we now have a system that is adaptable to any impact they receive. And that's our best hope. In the pandemic situations, we wish to have that we have a population which is, has herd immunity, which means they have the built the resistance to the virus. So even if there is a possibility of a pathogen active, will not have a chance to spread. And that is the resilience in the community we all wish to have. In the processing facilities, also, likewise, we design and operate our plant so that they are able to, or plant is able to handle certain level of fluctuation or abnormality without causing the disruption. Or in case if there is a disruption, it reverts back 
to its normal or close to the normal operations. So this resilience building is not a one step, but seven step process to achieve this eighth step. And that's where my key message is that there is a lot what has been undertaken in process system engineering related to safety that help us to guide in this pandemic. And to demonstrate that how effective could it be, we have undertaken a detailed study of some of the global nations, countries and cities. And I briefly mentioned these work, which one of our graduate students is, is submitting as a doctoral thesis, is that we develop the tools that help us to monitor the pandemic risk and then consider different criteria of the revolution technique and manage these risks effectively. So if, for example, this we propose a pandemic risk model, which has been uh, communicated and published in the journals. And this risk, follow, this risk model follows our traditional, what we do in industry routinely as a layer of protection analysis. So it considers a hierarchy of safety right from elimination all the way to a procedural safety through the PPEs and other mechanisms. And this help us to relate the work we do in industrial environment to things which we are observing in our community. Using these, we can able to identify threat, the uncertainty associated with that threat, develop the actions and the command action. So these four step process give us the basic understanding and control of the situation to manage the risk. Please remember, we are managing the risk. We are not able to get rid of the pathogen at this stage. We are living with it, but managing it in such a way that its impact remain to be the minimum. It's the same way as in our processing industries, we see the disturbance coming routinely or, 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 or frequently, but we have built a system resistance so that they are able to absorb these abnormalities and continue to operate. Here is the what individual risk models which we have used to demonstrate that that help the actions were planned and executed in the best manner would give us the idea or the situation where we are best hoping for. Example, here from a city of St. John's where we live is how pandemic would be when we have no response to how different responses would be when we take the lockdown, social distancing and personal protective gears to take place. And these outcomes, what we been is reported, compared and validated against the field observation. And it's being pleased, I'm pleased to mention that that has been observed that these serve the purpose the best. So by using the of mechanism of risk management, we could able to better understand evolving situations and design strategies to manage them effectively. With this, I will conclude that pandemic risk is a lot to learn from industry. Likewise, industry has a lot to learn from, from evolving situations such as pandemic. We have tools and mechanisms in our hand that help us to guide on to these situations to manage better. My basic element of today's talk is to convince you that using the existing knowledge and tools, we can prepare ourselves to respond to a situation like pandemic or an evolving accident situation in our processing facility. If we do so, we will be in far better situations as compared to we react when we see the challenge we are faced. With this, thank you very much for the learned host to invite me and I'll be happy to take questions on these. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Faisal Khan, for this useful lecture. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Yaqub, um, uh, good afternoon, um, Mr. Faisal. Good morning for you uh, for very interesting, um, um, formative, and um, integrated uh, presentation. I have questions. We know that the um, ISO standard, we have occupational health and safety standard, ISO uh, 45001. And we know that um, uh, um, due to pandemic uh, COVID 19 issues, uh, uh, ISO specialists for the how to treatment for the COVID-19, ISO uh, 45,005. 
there's some efforts for integrations of the, the process safety management system with the occupational health and safety. And maybe we have a questions about the standardizations of the uh, uh, process safety management system. Uh, do, you ha do you have or um, uh, do you support the efforts for the integrations between occupational health and process safety management system? And we know a lot of accidents was happened during this COVID-19 due to the lockdown and reducing the number of the employees. So um, thanks, uh, Jakub, for a good question. Yes, uh, first, yes, there are many accidents reported due to the actions taken in as a reaction by the government or the policies that led to a serious accident in the industry. Yes, that happened across the globe. There are far more in India and China and other countries where the lockdown was quite severe and they didn't have proper planning of how to manage these systems. Other nations have developed what we call as to be industry as a critical operations, and they had the flexibility to manage them a bit better. Your second part, does the occupational safety and process safety have an integration? My answer is yes. These are just like five fingers in a hand. All the safety elements are these fingers. You could continue to say this is middle finger, this is long finger, that's all good. But when you talk about the hand, which is what our aim is, all these are integral part of it. So my dear friend, whether we call engineering safety, occupational safety, process safety, nuclear safety, and all these, they're all important integral part of our hand. If we want to remain safe, we need to understand them, their interaction, and manage them in the most effective way we can. Uh, thank you for um, uh, for your presentations. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I have interested for the for your um, presentations how to integrate the um, the method for treatment of the COVID nineteen and uh, uh, and how to integrate with the process safety management system. Uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Shaima, uh, uh, please. Okay, I have uh, another question. Uh, you say that uh, the lockdown is not give the result for the world. Do you think that uh, the world will go to the perfect uh, to deal with the pandemic COVID-19 in the next days? Um, uh, Mr. Shama, I wouldn't be able to say the perfect, but for sure uh, we would be better prepared uh, for a next pandemic once it comes. And if we fail to learn from this and adopt ourselves, then we are going to be doomed. And this is one of the important message I wanted to convey is that the, the COVID-19 is not a simply dropped from the sky. It was something that we seen happening in past. There were situations, for example, SARS in 2012, then MARS in 2014. So there were a smaller level of pandemic happened or epidemic happened, but they didn't come to the stage because they were quickly being resolved within the boundaries. So if we have learned and adopt to it, we will be resilient and able to manage better for the next round of situation. Now, the question is, will we become back to the normal post vaccinations? Answer is no. As you all understand that industrial operations, when we have an accident and we retrofit or we revive or renovate our plant, it's not going to be the same as what it was original. In some cases, it might perform better if we have done a lot of changes, a lot of good changes by replacing the old component. But if we simply did a retrofit, then perhaps we might see situations happening again soon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Faisal Khan, uh, for this useful lecture. And we'll go to the next lecture.